BMR Racing has the skill and experience to win endurance races, but their engine could use a little work. Today on Engine Power, we meet the team competing with a Fox Body Mustang in a field full of exotics, and then we get started on a power plant to provide almost three times the horsepower of their current bullet. Welcome to Engine Power. Today we have some very special guests in house because we're involved with a project that we're very excited about. We have the guys here from BMR Racing and teaming up with Summit, we're gonna do something pretty special. Now last year we were afforded the opportunity to build a UMP open wheel modified. Now this is all based off of grassroots racing and this time we're teaming up with the endurance team to build an engine that has to have good parts and be built right to be bulletproof. Uh, tell us a little bit about um, how the original startup of the car went as far as parts and what you were your goals for the car. Okay, the original car was built for drag racing. I mean, somebody took a stock 302, put a cam in it, and we had a time crunch. And it was the best Fox body Mustang that we could find in our area. We left the stock engine, well, stock plus cam engine in it. We upgraded the suspension some, better wheels, tires, obviously, better springs, sway bars and uh, we went out and raced it because that's all the time we had for it. The engine lasts about five hours into a 24-hour race and it just completely gave up its guts on the track. At that point we uh, found a stock engine. It was actually a Ford remanufactured 5.0 stock engine and the reason why we kept going with the stock engine is because it was reliable. Now how many laps do you guys usually run this car a year? One race is eight it's to nine hours. So 500, 500 miles in one race weekend. Now there's uh, five different classes that run in this endurance series. What class is this car slated in? Right now it's in class three, but the classes are based off of your lap time. There's a qualification day and they just separate everybody that way. We're aiming for class five, which is the fastest class. Okay, so now uh, fast forward to what was the inspiration to start on a different bullet for this thing and upgrade the car? Is this, you, you, wanna, you wanna run in the class five, that's the motivation? Yes. Oh we yeah, absolutely. Yeah. Like we were saying before, we're race racing card. I mean, we're all super competitive, and when you're running mid pack, it's it's a good time. But you want all of us want to be up front. When you're mashing a pedal down, you're denting the floor because the car won't go any yeah. faster. Yeah. That, that's what's going on right now. And in a in a series kind of overrun by European cars, it's nice to stand out with that American muscle, you know what I'm saying? Yeah. And I agree. Now, how, is there any other American cars in this, I mean, lot, any other run? Occasionally, uh, one other Fox body will show up, okay. but for the most part, it's all European sports cars. These guys have been working on the cars over the years, and we've been getting faster and faster every year. You know, second here, second here. But we're finishing lower and lower because they're coming out with BMWs and Porsches, and it's nearly, we're, in, we're kind of in the wrong class. And it is a lot of fun, but we still like to be up the front. It's not a lot of fun in October if you've got no chance of winning. That's why this project is very important for us, because you guys are going to put us back winning again. Right now, what's holding us back, you know, is the power. Um, I mean, we've wrung the neck out of this car as much as we possibly can. I mean, we're driving this thing to death. Um, you know, we're killing the car, you know, just overcompensating for the lack of power. Uh, what kind of power are you guys looking for? We're looking for between 550 and 600 horsepower. With our weight, that's what we need. What you want is achievable, and I think with the parts that we've got, we've got a lot of great parts from Summit, and I think that uh, we are we are going to be a player. I say we like I'm going to be there, like driving a damn thing, right? But, uh, <laughs> but, but that's you guys, you know what I'm saying? Yeah. Um, but you can yeah. drive if you want. Oh no, you don't want me driving. <laughs> What we've decided, and between everyone, this is going to be a 363-inch deal. Um, the block is a Dart Iron Eagle, things four and an eighth bore. And the big appeal with this engine is every part of it's available through some, and, and this is going to be a bolt-together deal. It's going to make some great power. So at 363 inches, we have a set of Trick Flow 11R heads. They flow a ton of air. Um, the valve train in them, we'll, we'll have, we're having a, a, a more endurance based valve train with Jessel stuff, very rigid, very accurate. Forged rotating assembly with a Lunati crank and some Eagle rods. Uh, DSS made us a nice set of pistons for this thing. This thing is still going to be a pump gas engine. We got a bunch of parts that are going to complement everything that you do and I, I, we're going to build you an anvil is what we're going to do. We're excited. Very excited to be part of this and uh, we're flattered and honored that we're going to help you out with this. No, we're flattered that you guys are going to do it for us. I just can't wait for the payoff. 
You know, and we would like to thank you guys and, and Summit for um, being part of this and, and helping us with this project. Um, you know, I know it's in good hands with you guys. Thank you very much. It's gonna be it's gonna be fun. Up next, when you're building an endurance engine, attention to detail is critical. Power Nation is brought to you by Rock Auto. This build has to start somewhere, so we decided to prep the foundation to get it ready for all the slick parts it's about to receive. Now that's a Dart Iron Eagle small block Ford block that's designed for hardcore racing. Endurance races are just that, due to the long run times and big RPM swings that this engine's going to see. Dart has addressed all of the weaknesses of the factory castings by improving the cylinder wall thickness and decks and beefing up the main webbing while adding four bolt steel main caps. The three center caps have splayed outer bolts for additional strength. The oiling system is a low restriction priority main oiling design that also has an inlet in the rear for an external oil pump feed. The head bolt holes are blind tapped to eliminate any water leakage and the entire operation is cast out of premium high strength cast iron. It was shipped with a 4-115 bore, so we have to put our Sunnen SV-15 hone to work. The final bore will be 4-125, so we have to remove 10 thousandths of material from the cylinders. To properly hone a block, a torque plate is a must. So is a gasket with the same bore diameter. We also have to make sure that the bolt length is the same. That will make sure the bore distortion when torquing the bolt is the same as when the cylinder head is torqued to the block. We've went ahead and roughed the block out before the plate was installed. So with the dial bore gauge set to our final bore size, we have five thousandths left to hone. Now the hone is positioned over the first cylinder that will be enlarged. Then it's carefully guided into the bore and the flexible hose for the honing oil is positioned over that. The hone is turned on and the material removal has begun. When you see the up and down motion stop while the hone is still spinning, that is called dwell. The machine detects a tight spot and will focus on that area to get everything even before it continues the cycle. We're using a 220 grit diamond abrasive to size the cylinder within a half thousandth of final dimension. Once the first cylinder is finished, there are no more adjustments needed for the machine until we switch stones for final bore sizing. Absolutely gorgeous. And for final sizing, we are switching out to an 800 grit diamond abrasive. This will allow us to precisely remove the last half thousandths to achieve a plateau hone finish and the final bore size of 4125. This is not the only machining needed. We are going to remove the main caps and give everything a quick wash to remove the honing oil. After that, a mock-up is necessary to determine how much the decks need to be cut for where we want the pistons positioned in the bore at TDC. With a clean block mounted to our engine stand, we can begin that mock-up phase of this 363 cubic inch endurance engine build. It involves installing the new crankshaft along with the rod and piston assemblies, but they will not have any spiral locks or piston rings on them. That allows us to rotate every piston up to TDC and measure to determine how much deck has to come off this thing to achieve our proper deck clearance. Now, we're not worried about checking bearing clearances at this time, and we're going to be using a set of mock-up bearings to get the job done. We use regular engine oil on the bearings for this and we don't have to torque anything. Now the crank is laid in place and the main caps positioned in their assigned locations. The main bolts are snugged down so the caps are aligned. The piston and rod assembly is installed and the cap is snug. A bridge and dial indicator is placed on the deck and zeroed out. Now the piston is positioned at top dead center using the indicator. It's placed over the top half of the piston and rocked back and forth. It measures 10 and a half thousandths. The same procedure is done to the bottom half of the piston. This reading is 11 thousandths. We will check this block at all four corners, which will let us know how accurate the decks are. They were within 1 thousandths corner to corner, so we won't have to have the deck cut because at 11 thousandths in the hole, we can get what we want for deck clearance with the proper head gasket. Coming up, the small block Ford gets some color and a crank. The next phase of this build is more prep work. 
Engine blocks can always use some love in the deburring department. Deburring is simply removing sharp edges from the block to make it safer to handle and also remove stress risers which are associated with the start of cracks in the casting. This process is very simple. A die grinder and carbide burr allow you to remove all the sharp edges. Don't let the burr gouge the block. Use extremely light pressure so just the 90 degree sharp edge is removed. Pretty much every edge you can get to safely will benefit from this procedure. After you've hit the last area, use a cartridge roll to finish it off. The cylinders also need to be chamfered. A drill and a cylinder chamfering cone is what you'll need. The reason for this is to aid in ring installation. A minimal amount of material is removed. Too much taken out and compression could be sacrificed. After deburring and chamfering, a thorough wash is necessary. We're using our JRI heated block washer, but if you are doing this at home, a good degreaser and soap mix will get the job done. A pressure washer or water hose will finish it off. With the block out of the washer and mated back to the stand, it's time to add some color. The BMR race team specifically requested Ford Blue. Duplicolor will allow us to meet their request with their engine enamel with ceramic in the famous blue oval, Ford Blue color. You can use it on blocks, intake manifolds, oil pans, valve covers, and any other engine accessory. It's resistant to oil and fluids and withstands heat up to 500 degrees intermittent. Before we stick in anything permanent in the block, like the plugs or the cam bearings, we are gonna set our main bearing clearance. And the reason is, if we have to have the block aligned honed, we'll have to clean it again, and that will put grit behind our cam bearing and be tough to get out. We will check the clearances with a standard set of bearings first. If our clearance is tight for the application, there are some options to correct it. Our crankshaft journal measures 2.2483. Now we can set up the dial bore gauge and make sure it's zeroed out. With the standard set of bearings, the clearance between the main bearing and the crankshaft journal is 15 10 thousandths, which is insufficient for our application. To get it in range, a set of X bearings are necessary. The X stands for additional one thousandths of bearing clearance. Remember the rule of thumb for proper clearance is one thousandths per inch of shaft diameter in a race application like this. For most popular engine platforms, both one thousandths additional and one thousandths less clearance are available. Now the X bearings are installed. The bore gauge is already set up, so all we have to do is measure the ID of these. We have 25 10 thousandths of clearance, which is really good. The minimum would be 24 10 thousandths due to the shaft diameter. If your vehicle has a vacuum leak, it won't run well. So to find vacuum leaks easy, use the new Matco Tools Smoke Leak Locator. It's the smallest and lightest fully featured machine available, and it detects leaks as small as 10 thousandths of an inch. In addition, the Smoke Leak Locator performs air leak decay test. The Cerama Heat technology produces thick, dense smoke, and the machine runs on either baby oil or mineral oil. Now, it also comes with this nice plastic case to house all the accessories. You can find out more information about it at matcotools.com. If you have a 1986 or older small block Chevy and want the benefits of a self-learning electronic fuel injection system, then the Edelbrock Pro Flow 4 EFI kit is what you need. It comes with a traditional satin finish single plane intake manifold, a 4150 style 1000 CFM throttle body, and is equipped with 29 pound per hour injectors capable of 450 horsepower at 58 PSI of fuel pressure. A plug and play single connection distributor that is specifically designed to work with the ProFlow 4 is included too. The new ECU has a faster processor, so the self learning curve is super fast, and an easy setup wizard will get you going once the system is installed. The optional Android tablet will allow you to download the eTuner 4 app for free or use your smartphone to control the system to see all of your engine's vitals. To find out more and purchase an Edelbrock ProFlow 4, go to edelbrock.com. Up next, for any engine to go the distance, a balanced rotating assembly is a must. Power Nation is brought to you by Rock Auto. During the break, we installed the cam bearings. Here's a quick look at one of them. They are supplied from Dart and are specific to the block. A PTFE rear main seal is placed on the crankshaft. This type of seal does not get lubricated when installed. 
For reference, it was ordered for a 92 Fox Body Mustang with a 5 liter. This is a Lunati Voodoo 4340 non twist forged crankshaft. It has a 3 400 stroke, two 250 main journals, and two 100 rod journals, and must be used with narrowed or chamfered rod and main bearings. Lightning holes in the rod journals reduce crankshaft inertia for increased engine acceleration. It has micro polished journals and has been nitride heat treated. With the X bearings in place, Permatech's ultra slick assembly lube will protect the bearings and journals from any damage during initial startup. We had the rotating assembly balanced at Shacklet Auto Machine in Nashville, Tennessee. They are a full service machine shop that deals with everything from stock rebuilds to high end race engines of all types. Because we used individual components instead of a complete kit, we are responsible for getting it balanced. Now we're going to determine what the bob weight total is by weighing the components here. That includes the piston, rings, bearings, and connecting rod. It requires a rod balancing fixture and an accurate scale. Both of these came from Goodson. The first thing we do is weigh for the reciprocating weight. It includes the pistons, pins, locks, rings, and small end of the connecting rod. It is all recorded in grams. Next we will weigh for the rotating weight, which is a set of bearings and the big end of the connecting rod. This weight is multiplied by two since there are two assemblies on each journal. Our bob weight total is 1,747 grams. Billy Trask used our bob weight card to make up bob weights for the balancing process. After the weights are attached to the crank journals, the crank is spun up to see how much material has to be removed from the counterweights. This is done repeatedly until the crank is within spec for our application. After balancing, the crankshaft will be polished, cleaned, then ready to install. The crank only needed 13 grams off on the front and 8 grams off on the back to get it within spec for our application. To remove the weight, material is drilled from the counterweight side where the Heinz balancer references the location. When we return to the Summit 363 build, we'll begin assembly. Until then, for more information on anything you've seen today, visit PowerNationTV.com. There are more intake manifolds on the market today than you can shake a stick at. There are ones for single, double, and even triple carburetors, and there's also a bunch for fuel injection, like stack injection, multipoint, or even throttle body, plus different types of manifolds from dual plane, single plane, and even tunnel rams. The purpose of manifold talk today is for a specific engine we recently dynoed. We saw significant gains between a dual plane and a single plane version. Now there are several reasons why we see changes in airflow characteristics, RPM ranges, fuel delivery, and of course power. A dual plane separates the manifold into two different plenum sections. Each one along with its separate set of runners to connect every other cylinder in the firing order. This allows a dual plane to see induction pulses every 180 degrees of crankshaft rotation. That allows them to do a better job balancing the air and fuel mixture from cylinder to cylinder throughout the RPM range. Although these manifolds are great at fuel distribution, they are quite restrictive in a high performance application due to their small cross-sectional area in the plenum. They are designed for good drivability and low to mid RPM ranges, but that doesn't mean that they won't make power. We have had several of these that will make over 500 horsepower. A single plane intake manifold has a single open plenum that sees all eight cylinders. A larger cross-sectional area and a deeper plenum allow these manifolds to flow a lot more air than a dual plane. They are designed for more mid to high RPM applications. If hood clearance is not an issue, a tunnel ram is a great choice for performance in a wide RPM range. Now it's still a single plane design, but its advantage is a straight runner with a clear eye shot from the carburetor all the way down to the intake valve. Depending on the runner length and plenum volume, they can be designed to make power virtually anywhere in the RPM range, as low as 4,000 and as high as 10,000 RPM. The difference in dual plane and single plane power was displayed in excellent fashion with our old gray mare 408 inch stroker. We ran both a dual plane and single plane manifold and here are the results.
Now that you've seen that, you know the advantages of a single plane manifold. The same goes for a tunnel ram. If you have a daily driver that's pretty mild, the dual plane is the way to go. But if you've got a car that you take to the strip and drive on the street, definitely lean towards a single plane.